Last week we told the story of the prodigal son. Remember that story? Where the son goes to his dad, says, Dad, I, I want my inheritance now. I have no interest in waiting around with you until you grow old and die. Just give me my portion. My brother can grow old with you until you die. I want my now. He goes off. He spends all of it really quickly. And he comes back. And he's prepared to beg his father's forgiveness. And, and as he's walking down the road, his father sees him. And what is his father's response? He takes off running down to his son, wraps his arms around his son and shows him forgiveness. Now, last week we talked about that story because we were talking about grace. How this is an image of God who shows us forgiveness even when we don't deserve it. Well, sometimes I wonder, what happened to the prodigal son two years later? There he is, he's out in the fields with his older brother. His older brother's getting on his nerves, you know, always writing him about how he left, and left him to do all the work, how he mistreated their father, and the prodigal son begins to get perhaps a little bored. I mean, until he had spent all his money. It was pretty fun in that distant land. He did have a pretty good time. And he starts to think, perhaps, what if I did it again? What if I went to my dad and said, Dad, give me some money. I'm out of here. I mean, after all, if it didn't go well... He already knows that his father is a forgiving man, a man who shows grace, who gives what perhaps we don't deserve. I wonder if he was ever tempted, tempted to take advantage of his father's forgiveness and grace. Now, what kind of man would he be if he did so? What kind of man would he be if, after being shown such Tremendous grace would then take advantage of his father's kindness. I think you would agree, probably not a good one. Well, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, has been talking a lot about grace. And that is why this story works so well for us. He talks a lot about how we all get the kinds of things in Jesus that we don't deserve, as the prodigal son did. Justification, peace with God, eternal life. And because he's a smart guy, Paul anticipates an objection that his readers might have. Well, if I'm saved by grace, then why not just keep on sinning and ask for forgiveness? So Paul poses this question to start Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Now at first reading, this sounds like a pretty good idea. And a lot of people do subscribe to this theory, even if they don't admit it to themselves. If there are no repercussions to my actions then why stop? This is my dog, Spike. Spike's a jerk. You need to know that. Great dog, love him to bits, but he's a jerk. He's the dog who once got mad at me. I don't remember why. And because he was mad at me, he waited until I was in another room, climbed up on my kitchen table, and pooped right in the middle of the kitchen table. Spike is this tall. I don't know how he even got up there. He was filled with so much spite that it propelled him onto the table. And Spike, he believes that his place to sleep when I'm gone is on top of the couch. You know, on the very top cushion. But if you have a dog or a cat, you'll know that if an animal spends a lot of time up there, the couch begins to get a rut. <laughs> 
One side looks perfectly fine, a nice fluffed pillow, and the other side looks like this. So I am always telling my dog, get off the couch. And when I come home every single day, where do I find him? On the couch, exactly where I knew he'd be. You see, Spike knows what a lot of people know, and that's where there is grace, there is no fear. He is not afraid of me because he knows that there is nothing I will do to him. I might yell at him. I might even give him a gentle swat on his behind. But that's it. So in his mind, he figures eight hours of sleeping on the couch is well worth a gentle swat on the behind. You see, where there is grace, where there are no repercussions, there is no fear. And if there is no fear to motivate us to do good, then what will? Well, Paul makes his case. What shall we say? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? And here's his answer. By no means. He says, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, to understand his argument, we need to take a couple steps back and look at what Paul is doing. Because he's actually doing something really neat here that we miss if we don't look at the whole picture. See, what Paul is doing over the next few chapters of Romans is telling the story of Exodus in light of Christ. You know the Exodus? How Israel was freed out of slavery from Egypt, crossed that Red Sea, wandered through the desert, made it to the Promised Land? Well, Exodus tells that story how the children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt. And God heard them crying in the misery of slavery and oppression. And God sent Moses to bring them out and away to freedom, to the promised land. So they came through the Red Sea, leaving behind the land of slavery, discovering a new freedom. God led them to Mount Sinai where he gave them the law. And then they spent, well, They spent a little longer than they expected wandering in the desert, wandering and grumbling against God. But Moses continued to lead them. By his own presence, God led them in the pillar of cloud and fire until eventually they entered the land that they had been given as an inheritance. Now this story is well known, but what is not often recognized, is that here in Romans, Paul tells a version of that very same story, starting with this present passage. Romans 6 describes how Christians come through the water of baptism, just as Israel came through the waters of the Red Sea, and they leave behind a land of slavery and enter upon a new freedom. If you don't understand what Paul is doing here, you're going to find Romans 6 kind of strange to read. Now, in Romans 7, uh, Paul wrestles with the question of what happened on Mount Sinai and the problems that resulted, leading to a strange new fulfillment of that law. And then in Romans 8, he describes the Christian life in terms of leading his people home to their inheritance, which turns out not to be a small area in Israel, but actually the whole redeemed creation and he warns them this will be fun to talk about in a few weeks he warns them against the kinds of grumbling which the Israelites have been guilty do you remember when the Israelites were wandering in the desert they said to Moses why did you bring us out of slavery just so we could starve in the desert and so Paul is going to key into that as well but since we are In chapter 6, let us focus on this part of the Exodus story, the part where Israel is saved from slavery through the passage of water. 
You see, if you were to ask Paul, why shouldn't we keep on sinning if we're saved by grace? Paul's answer is going to be simple. He says, when you're freed from slavery, why would you ever go back? For Paul, when you become a Christian, you move from one type of humanity to another. And you should never think of yourself in the original mode again. When you become a Christian, you die to the old sinful you, and you rise again with the Messiah. And since, in Hebrew thinking, the Messiah represents his people, what's true of him is true of his people. Paul says, if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. You see, in Hebrew thinking, what is true of the king is also true of his people. And what is true of the Messiah is also true of his people. So we are united with Christ through faith, and we have died to the old sinful life. Just as he died, we too found in him, we died to that old life as well. But on the plus side, we also gain new life. Just as Christ moved from death to live, just as Israel moved from slavery to freedom, so do we. See the logic behind Paul's argument? And now here's the point that might rattle a few of us. For Paul, this point of unity is baptism. Is baptism. I know that sounds strange when you grow up hearing that your first point of connection with Christ is the sinner's prayer. And that the baptism is just something you do later as a symbol of that faith. Or if you grew up thinking that baptism is a nice ritual that you do with babies. But pay attention to what Paul says about baptism. And you're going to see that for Paul, baptism is the practical and physical beginning of a Christian's life. As it involves dying and rising again with the Messiah. Now, Paul understands baptism in terms of the exodus. A move through water from slavery to freedom. A new identity is given, even a new nature. So, bearing all of that in mind, shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? Well, no, Paul writes. Why would you do that? How can we live in it any longer? How can we live in it any longer? We died to sin. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We're dead to sin. Why would you go back to that? Speaking of that death, Paul continues his argument in verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God in the same way. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Do you think of yourselves this way? If you have come to Christ in faith, asked him to be your Lord and Savior, been baptized in obedience to the commandment to be baptized, do you think of yourself this way? Dead to sin and alive to God. Because that is the reality of the Christian experience. If you are found in him, you, are, you have died to sin. You have put that all behind you. And you now live in a new reality, a reality of eternal life, a reality where you are found alive in God. So, should we sin that grace may abound all the more? No. You died to sin. You put off slavery. You put on eternal life. Why would you go back? Paul says, therefore, do not let sin reign 
in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Here, Paul argues that not only should you not go back to sin, but you should move forward into good works. When you are are united with Christ through baptism, it isn't just a passive declaration that you're free from sin, that you're going to heaven one day, but you are also given a new identity and a new master and a new purpose. You say, what? A new master? I thought we were freed from slavery. What do you mean, a new master? Well, Paul explains a little more. What then, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin which leads to death or obedience, or to obedience which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. There was a farmer, let's say a thousand years ago, right in the heart of the Middle Ages. And this farmer owned a small piece of land that belonged to a land baron who owned all of the land, because that's the way it worked back then. And so this farmer tried to eke out the best living he could on his land. He was an honest man, grew his crops, traded with his neighbors around him. But the landowner, who owned all of the land upon which his land stood, was not a kind man. And that landowner would often ask the farmer to to defend his lands or to invade other territories as he sought to increase his landownings. And from time to time, they would come by and demand taxes of him that he just couldn't pay and survive. And then there came a time when the landowner came to the farmer and said, we need you to take your your implements of farming and beat them down into implements of weaponry and war. You're going to join us. We're off to war. One day... The farmer got an idea in his head. He said, while the landowner is off, busy fighting a war, I'm going to move my family. And so he moved his family, not too far away, to the property of a new landowner. This landowner was kind and wise. And the farmer purchased an area of land on the landowner's property began to farm. The landowner came by, demanded tribute from him, but a fair tribute. Whatever you can afford, it all goes to the common good, said the landowner. Another time the landowner sent a messenger by and said, a neighbor's barn has burned down. I'd like to ask you to come, bring your tools, bring some lumber, We're going to fix the neighbor's barn. And so it would go on for many years that the new landowner would demonstrate his generosity. And he would ask of the farmer, but only in things that were for the common good. This is the story that Paul is telling. We serve a master. We can serve sin, which only takes from us, leads us into death, twists our hearts and our souls, leaves us like the prodigal son, destitute, feeding the swine, 
with no hope. Or we can serve the Lord God, who is kind and gracious, full of mercy, and who does ask of us, but asks us to participate in life-giving things. Asks us to join in him, in his kingdom, in building a world of peace and love. So, here we find two estates. One landowner is ruthless, the other is kind. Both ask of him, one leads to freedom, one leads to death and destruction. Which do you choose? Which do you choose? For me, the answer is simple. For you, maybe it's not as easy. I choose to serve the Lord God. His way leads to life. I've been set free from sin, so why would I want to be a slave once again? Paul writes, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things resulted in death. But now that you have been set free from sin, you've become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ. So, who do you wish to serve? You can serve your desires and your addictions and your insecurities and your fears or your ego, but that is just a form of slavery that leads to death. Or you can be free from sin and serve God, which leads to eternal life. And sometimes this might mean that he puts you to work asks you to sacrifice, or places you in an uncomfortable situation, but his way always leads to life. His way is always better. So what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Dear church, We were baptized into the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have put off that old identity. We've taken up a new one. We have switched allegiances. We now serve a new master. And it's in serving him that we are truly free. Let's pray.